Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you back to Midnight Stories, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the tale. But before that, please consider giving us a like. I tug at the nylon straps of my backpack, loosening them slightly to distribute the weight more evenly. The backpack is packed with essentials like a first aid kit, water bottles, and trail mix. My shoulders feel less burdened now, allowing me to enjoy the hike better. The forest around me is a thick maze of trees, their branches intertwining above to form a canopy that filters sunlight into dappled patterns on the ground. The trail we are on is not wide, barely allowing two people to walk side by side. It winds through the forest, its path marked by the occasional wooden sign or colored ribbon tied to a tree branch. Every so often the trail opens up into small clearings where sunlight streams through, illuminating patches of wildflowers and shrubs. The ground is uneven, filled with roots and small rocks that demand attention as we walk. Up ahead, Katie, Mark, and Tom engage in lively conversation. They share jokes and anecdotes, their laughter serving as a natural soundtrack to our journey. Katie is in a red windbreaker and cargo pants, equipped with a camera that she uses to capture the scenic beauty around us. Mark, dressed in a dark green shirt and hiking boots, is the unofficial navigator consulting the trail map every so often to keep us on course. In a blue t-shirt and shorts, carries a portable speaker in one hand, although he's left it off to allow us to soak in the natural sounds of the forest. We have looked forward to this hike for a long time. Planning began months ago over group chats and video calls. Lists were made, gear was purchased, and dates were set. Our anticipation grew with each passing day, culminating in last night's final check of our packing lists and weather forecasts. We loaded our cars with our backpacks and set off, eager to embrace the adventure that awaited us. Every rustling leaf or distant bird call adds to the atmosphere, heightening our senses and curiosity. The smell of damp earth and foliage fills the air, mixing with the scent of the energy bars and fruit in our backpacks. Despite the physical exertion, there's a mental relaxation that comes with being in nature. The act of walking. The rhythmic crunch of leaves under our boots creates a meditative state. Our thoughts drift away on the here and now. As I continue to walk, my initial discomfort from the weight of the backpack has vanished. The straps no longer dig into my shoulders, now just a secure embrace that reminds me I am prepared for this journey. With each step I feel more connected to the trail, the forest, and my friends who share this experience with me. We all sense it. This hike is what we've been waiting for, and every moment is one to savor. Guys, look at that! Katie calls our attention, pointing to an opening among the trees. As we step into the clearing, it becomes apparent that this is an abandoned campsite. Two tents, both in shades of blue and green, are pitched a few feet apart. Some knocked over as if left in a hurry. The remains of a fire pit are in the middle, ashes and charred wood indicating it hasn't been used recently. By the trunk of a large oak tree sits a blue cooler. That's odd, Mark says, scratching his head. He's looking around, taking in the eerie stillness. It's as if they set everything up, got comfy, and then just disappeared. Do you think they're coming back? Tom is already by the cooler, flipping its lid open. Inside we see it's well-stocked, cans of soda, bottled water, prepackaged sandwiches, and even some fruit. Seems like they planned on staying a while. I'm not sure what to think, I reply, picking up a lantern that dangles from a tree branch. The lantern is sleek, designed with a metallic finish and a solar recharging panel. It's not cheap. Why would anyone abandon such expensive equipment? Katie, meanwhile, has wandered over to one of the camping chairs and notices a leather-bound journal on it. She picks it up and flips through its pages. There are entries here dating up to yesterday. It's like they were jotting down thoughts and then, poof, they're gone. Tom puts down a can of soda he was inspecting and joins Katie. Are there any clues in the journal? Maybe they mentioned seeing something strange. Katie scans the last few entries quickly. Nothing out of the ordinary. They talk about the weather, the hike, and the beauty of the forest. Then it just stops. Mark, who had been examining the fire pit, joins us. No signs of a struggle or hurried packing. It's like they stepped out and never returned. Okay, this is getting creepy, Mark says, his eyebrows furrowing as he glances from one face to another. There's a palpable tension now. His voice is low, almost a whisper, 
as if he's afraid the trees might overhear. We should set up our camp a bit further away. If these people come back, we can figure out what happened, Tom proposes. He points to a location that's visible from where we stand, but separated by a dense collection of trees and underbrush. His face displays a mix of curiosity and caution, a reflection of the conflicting emotions we all feel. I find myself wrestling with doubt. Do we really want to get involved in this? What if something bad happened? The words escape my mouth before I fully process them, revealing my internal hesitation. I think about our planned weekend of adventure and how it's now teetering on the edge of something darker. I say we stay, Katie speaks up, breaking the brief silence that followed my question. Her eyes meet each of ours in turn, as if challenging us to reconsider. We're well prepared. We have all the gear we need and there's safety in numbers. Plus, if these people are lost or in trouble, we might be able to help them. After a few moments, which feel much longer given the circumstances, we all nod in agreement. The decision is unanimous. We'll stay, set up our own camp, and see if the night offers any answers. Turning our backs to the abandoned campsite, we trek 100 yards through the forest to the spot Tom indicated. The ground here is relatively flat, covered in a thin layer of fallen leaves. Nearby is a small stream, its water glistening in the fading sunlight, offering both a source of fresh water and a calming background noise. One by one, we unload our backpacks and start setting up our tents. Tom and Mark handle the tent poles and stakes, efficiently assembling the nylon structures. As we finish setting up camp, the sun dips below the horizon, painting the sky with shades of orange and purple. We find ourselves in a new setting, but with our thoughts still anchored to the mysterious campsite nearby. The tents are up, the stove is lit, and we're as prepared as we can be for whatever comes next. Night falls more quickly than any of us anticipates. The forest transforms into a sonic landscape as the sky darkens. Crickets chirp in a rhythmic pattern, adding a constant undertone to the more erratic rustling of leaves in the wind. But with these normal sounds are anomalies. The sporadic snap of a twig, an unidentifiable rustle in the underbrush, or a distant noise that doesn't fit into the usual nighttime chorus. Did you hear that? Katie's whisper cuts through the air, her voice tinged with concern as we huddle around our campfire. The flames flicker across her face, casting alternating patterns of light and shadow. Yes, Mark answers, his eyes narrowing as he listens intently to the forest around us. It sounded like footsteps, but they weren't heavy. Definitely not a person, something lighter. We're probably just spooking ourselves, Tom chimes in, trying to ease the growing tension. He grins a bit, but his eyes don't completely match his smile. Could be a deer or some other wildlife. This is their home, after all. Feeling the need for additional security, I reach for some firewood from the pile we collected earlier. Placing the logs onto the burning embers, the fire responds with an enthusiastic leap of flames. Regardless of what's out there, let's keep our flashlights and bear spray within arm's reach tonight, I suggest. Nods of agreement circle around the fire, and we each make a mental note of where we've stashed these items, while Mark adjusts the position of his flashlight so it's easier to grab. Tom double-checks the location of his multi-tool, complete with a whistle and small blade. Eventually, the time comes to retreat to our tents. We douse the fire carefully, ensuring no stray embers are left to pose a risk. One by one, we crawl into our respective tents and zip up the flaps, sealing ourselves off from the open air and its unsettling noises. Sleep, however, proves elusive. Inside my tent, every noise from the outside world seems magnified. My mind keeps going back to the abandoned campsite and now these unfamiliar sounds. Despite the close quarters and the presence of my friends in the nearby tents, a lingering feeling invades my thoughts. We are not alone in this forest. Around midnight, a change occurs in the forest's ambient noise, which have been a light breeze until now, start to carry an unusual sound. It's a faint rustle, but what makes it unsettling is its movement. The noise seems to be circling our campsite like a predator stalking its prey. My instincts kick in and I reach for my flashlight. I unzip the tent just enough to poke my head and flashlight out. The beam of light slices through the pitch black darkness, scanning from tree to tree and bush to bush. But it reveals nothing out of the ordinary. Do you see anything? 
Katie's voice is shaky, cutting through the silence from her tent just a few feet away. Nothing, I respond, the zipper making a grating sound as I seal the tent back up. But it feels like something is definitely out there, watching us or circling us or both. Me too, Mark interjects, his voice projecting from his own tent. Something's off. I can't put my finger on it, but the vibe is all wrong now. I'm lying in my sleeping bag, eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling of my tent. Every snap, rustle, or distant hoot outside has me on high alert. Just when I start to think I might finally drift off, a new sound catches my attention. A rustling, way too close to our campsite. Guys, are you still awake? I whisper, unzipping my tent and poking my head out. Yeah, Katie responds, her tent door also unzipped, flashlight in hand. Heard it too. Tom and Mark emerge from their tent. Heard what? Tom asks, rubbing his eyes. Shuffling like footsteps, I reply. We each clutch our flashlights tightly. Bear spray canisters are in our other hands and safety caps are off. Our eyes follow where the beams of our flashlights land, on tree trunks covered in moss, on leaves trembling in the night breeze and into the emptiness of the forest that stretches beyond. Despite our search, we find absolutely nothing. No rustling bushes, hiding animals, no lurking figures, not even a stray footprint. Suddenly, Katie calls out, Guys, wasn't the bag right there? Her flashlight beam stops at a tree, illuminating the now empty rope we had used to hang our supplies. The rest of us turn our attention to the tree. It's true. The food bag is nowhere in sight. All that remains is the knotted rope we had slung over a branch dangling uselessly. Mark questions the obvious. You think an animal got it? A raccoon or something? Tom quickly dismisses the idea. It was too high up for an animal. Besides, we tied it tight. No way something could have gotten it down without making a lot of noise. As we head back to our respective tents, the atmosphere grows heavier with tension. Our footsteps seem cautious, almost timid against the carpet of leaves and twigs. Words are scarce, but the reality is dawning on each of us. We're not alone and whatever is out here with us is capable of more than we initially thought. Finding sleep is an impossible task. The air is thick with unease. Every snap of a twig outside sounds like a drum in the quiet of the forest. We lie there, each in our own tents, grasping at the hope for the morning light to break the uneasy night. Despite the anxiety, exhaustion eventually catches up with me. My eyelids grow heavy, and the noises of the forest blend into a distant, monotonous hum. Clutching my flashlight in one hand and bear spray in the other, I surrender to sleep. It's a restless slumber, filled with fragmented dreams that I can barely remember, but it's sleep nonetheless. I wake up to a soft glow penetrating the tent fabric. For a moment I'm disoriented, the events of the previous night rushing back as my eyes adjust. The tension in my muscles eases a bit as I realize the light outside is the rising sun not a flashlight or some other ominous sign. I'm greeted by the sight of sunlight filtering through the dense foliage, casting a mosaic of light and shadow on the forest floor. The trees, which seemed so menacing in the dark, now stand tall and innocuous in the daylight. As the morning light gradually fills our campsite, we step out of our tents, still groggy but also visibly relieved that night has passed. Then Tom calls us over with urgency in his voice. You need to see it. We walk over to where Tom is standing and see what caught his attention. Marks on the tree trunks surrounding our area. They look deliberate, like patterns or symbols. The indentations in the bark are deep, suggesting considerable force was applied. Katie directs our gaze to our tents. The same kind of strange, deliberate markings appear on the outermost fabric of our tents. The incisions are clean, not jagged indicating that whatever made them had a level of precision. As we're absorbing this, Mark suddenly realizes something is wrong. Wait a minute, where's my backpack? He says as he looks around the vicinity with growing alarm. We all start looking and soon find it, not far from where we are standing. The backpack is torn open and ripped along the seams. Its contents, food, a first aid kit, a water bottle, are scattered around as if thrown carelessly after the bag was gutted. This is bad, really bad, Mark says, his tone heavier with fear than it has been at any point since we arrived. We need to leave now, Katie insists. 
But what about the other campers, I question, finding it difficult to shake the thought that we should be doing something for them, even as we grapple with the need to secure our own well-being. Tom steps in with a dose of hard realism. Look, we can't help anyone if we're in danger ourselves. Our priority right now has to be getting to safety. Then we can think about getting help for them. After a brief pause to let Tom's words sink in, we all nod in agreement, united in the decision to leave. The process of taking down our tents is quick. We pack what remains of our supplies with haste, careful not to leave anything crucial behind. Tom checks the GPS to identify the most direct route back to the trailhead. As we set off, every sound in the environment seems to grab our attention. The rustling of leaves, distant animal calls, even the wind through the trees sets us on edge. We maintain a tight formation as we walk, ensuring that no one strays or lags behind. The thought that we're not alone persists in my mind, or someone is still watching us, tracking our movements as we make our way through the wilderness. After about 30 minutes of walking through the forest, Mark suddenly breaks the silence. We've passed this tree before, I'm sure of it, he says. I thought the GPS was supposed to get us out of here, Katie adds, looking down at the device in her hand. It's showing nonsense. I take out my own GPS and sure enough, it's glitching. This can't be happening, I mutter. Tom stops and scans the area. It's not just the GPS. Look at the trail, it's different. We pause, absorbing the gravity of what he's just said. We need to keep moving. Standing here won't help, Katie asserts, breaking the awkward silence that had enveloped us. Heeding her words, we start walking again, but the atmosphere is charged with unease. Our senses are heightened. Every sound in the forest is a cause for alarm. We wince at the sound of leaves crunching underfoot, twigs snapping in the distance, and branches swaying in the wind. Then Mark, who's leading the way, stumbles over an inconveniently placed tree root. His foot catches, and he tumbles forward with a yelp, hitting the ground hard. Are you okay? Katie is quick to react, rushing over to where Mark is sprawled on the ground. My ankle. Mark groans, his face twisted in pain as he grabs his leg above the boot. It really hurts. I think it's sprained. Tom sets his backpack on the ground and unzips it in a hurry. We can't ignore this. We need to do some first aid, he says, pulling out a red first aid kit. We find a relatively flat rock for Mark to sit on while Katie rolls up his pant leg. She takes an elastic bandage from the kit and starts to expertly wrap it around Mark's swollen ankle, trying to give it some support. As we're almost done with the makeshift medical procedure, a spine-chilling sound suddenly fills the forest air. The noise is unlike anything we've heard before, guttural, animalistic, and unnerving. What makes it worse is that it doesn't sound distant. It feels like it's coming from just beyond the tree line, uncomfortably close to where we are. We all freeze, staring wide-eyed at each other, the gravity of our situation sinking in deeper than ever before. What was that? The words barely make it out of my mouth, my voice shaky. It's close, whatever it is, Tom responds, his hands reaching into his backpack to pull out both his bear spray and flashlight. We can't keep moving quickly with Mark's injury. We need to set up a temporary camp, Katie proposes, scanning the area for a suitable nodding in agreement. We choose a location that has fewer trees, giving us a better line of sight in case something approaches. We unload our backpacks and start putting up our tents as quickly as we can. The process is rushed, but we manage to erect the tents without much fuss. Simultaneously, Tom starts gathering some twigs and branches for a fire. He arranges them in the middle of our makeshift camp, safely distant from the tents, and sets them alight with a fire starter. Soon the flames are flickering, casting dancing shadows on the surrounding area and giving us a small but vital source of light. It's not an ideal setup, but under the circumstances, it's the best we can do to provide some security and visibility. We should take turns keeping watch, Tom suggests, his eyes meeting each of ours in turn. Something is out there, and we can't all afford to sleep. I volunteer for the first shift, partly because I know I won't be able to sleep anyway. Tom hands me the bear spray. I position myself on a large flat rock near the fire, which has dwindled down to embers. The dim light it provides mixes with the moonlight filtering through the trees. My senses are razor sharp, my ears strain to pick up any sound that doesn't belong, and my eyes survey the semi-darkness. 
Time seems to stretch. Each minute feeling like an hour. The forest is filled with natural sounds, but each one makes my heart race. The snap of a twig, the rustle of leaves in the slight wind, all magnified in the tense silence. Just when I'm beginning to think that maybe, just maybe, my mind is playing tricks on me, I feel it, a presence. It's as if the temperature drops a few degrees and a shiver runs down my spine, is observing us hidden in the shadows. I raise my flashlight with shaky hands, its beam slicing through the dark as I aim it toward the trees. All I see are shifting shadows and the usual forest scenery. Then a sudden movement catches my eye. Something fast skirts the edge of our camp. It knocks over our neatly stacked firewood with a clatter and rustles a nearby bush with enough force to suggest it's larger than a small animal. Before I can even shout a warning, it's gone, melting away into the depths of the dark forest. Did you hear that? Katie bolts upright from her tent. I did, and I felt it too, I say, my voice barely above a whisper. Something was here. Tom and Mark come out of their tents, looking rattled. We need to stay alert, Tom says, his eyes darting into the darkness. Whatever it is, it knows we're here. It's a long night. With each passing hour, the sense of dread grows. We are not alone in this forest, and whatever is out there is not afraid of us. In fact, I can't shake the terrible thought that it's toying with us, waiting for the right moment. We can't just sit here like sitting ducks. We need to do something, Tom says pacing in the limited space between our tents. His pacing is agitated, and his eyes are fixed on the ground as if he's solving a puzzle. I agree. We have some camping gear, ropes, and a few tools. Why don't we set up traps, Katie suggests, already unzipping her backpack to pull out a coil of strong nylon rope. Sounds like a plan, Mark adds. He attempts to stand but winces and readjusts his seated position, clutching his ankle. We dig into our supplies. Tom finds a small hammer and a bag of nails in his pack. Katie lays out the nylon ropes and a set of carabiners on a flat rock. I unearth a roll of duct tape and some zip ties from my bag. We break into teams to cover more ground. Katie and I focus on the ropes, fashioning them into snares and trip wires. We choose locations strategically, near the faint trails through the grass and around bushes that have shown signs of recent disturbance. We tie knots, loop the snares around branches, and fasten them securely to tree trunks. Tom, who's working solo due to Mark's condition, takes the cooking pots and pans. He hangs them from lower tree branches using zip ties, placing them at various intervals around our campsite. The idea is simple. If something or someone comes too close, the pans will clang together, alerting us. Once the traps and alarms are set, we step back to survey our work. We rekindle the fire, making it bigger this time. The flames dance higher, casting a larger circle of light around our camp. Katie pulls out a bag of fire starters from her backpack and we use them liberally, hoping the light and crackling noise deter whatever lurks in the shadows. We change our watch strategy. No one will keep watch alone, it's pairs from here on out. Katie and Mark volunteer for the first shift. Tom and I agree to take the second, taking the chance to get a bit more rest before our turn. We sit in our respective tents trying to catch a nap but too anxious to really fall asleep. Then it happens. A loud clanging noise fills the air, followed by that awful throaty sound that we've all come to dread. It's close, too close, and our hearts pound in our chests like drums. We've got something. Katie's voice is piercing as it cuts through the tension. She's holding a flashlight, its beam pointing toward the spot where the noise came from. Bursting out of our tents, Tom and I join Katie and Mark at the sight of the triggered snare. The nylon rope is pulled taut, stretched to its limit. The surrounding bushes are disturbed, leaves crinkled as if something rushed through them. It was here. It was definitely here, Mark says, his voice tinged with a mixture of excitement and fear. Scanning the bushes and trees around us as if expecting the creature to reappear. The trap worked, but not well enough, Katie adds, inspecting the snare. The knot is still secure, but whatever was caught managed to free itself. She starts to reset the trap, repositioning the loop and making sure it's anchored well. At least we know they work. Reset it and let's all try to get some rest, Tom suggests, his voice as steady as it can be under the circumstances. We'll need our energy for tomorrow. He's right. We reset the traps and head back to our camp. We keep the fire burning brightly, adding more logs and fire starters. 
The rest of the night is tense, filled with moments of half-sleep interrupted by jolts of alertness at every rustle or distant noise. Even the wind seems to conspire against our rest, howling softly through the trees. No more traps are triggered. The pots and pans remain silent and the snares lay undisturbed. When dawn breaks, the forest becomes quiet in an unsettling way. The earlier chirping of birds is absent and even the sound of the leaves waving in the wind seems muted. The silence feels thick and heavy in the air and we take it as a sign. We dismantle the tents as fast as possible, folding the fabric and poles as best as we can in our hurried state. Our backpacks are loaded with camping gear, food, and the first aid kit for Mark. Tom puts out the fire, scattering the ashes and making sure no smoldering embers remain. We set out, and Mark is clearly in pain as he hobbles along, his face flushed and sweaty. We take turns supporting him, wrapping arms around his waist to take some weight off his injured ankle. We trudge through the thick forest, our eyes constantly scanning for the familiar landmarks we might have passed earlier. But everything looks different now. The trail is less recognizable, the trees more imposing, as if they've conspired to keep us within their shadowy confines. Hours pass and each of us feels the strain. Our water bottles are nearly empty and we've rationed the last of the energy bars. Legs are aching and morale is dipping. When finally we see a clearing up ahead, the sparse canopy opens up to reveal a patch of sky and the underbrush gives way to a flat, grassy expanse. For a moment, hope fills the air. We made it, I whisper, the words barely escaping my lips as tears of relief fill my eyes. The sight of the clearing feels like a balm to our collective souls, a promise of safety after endless hours of uncertainty and fear. However, just as we are about to take our first steps into the clearing, Mark collapses. He hits the ground hard, his face twisted in a grimace of pain and exhaustion. I can't, I can't go any further, he gasps clutching his sprained ankle, which is now swollen to the size of a grapefruit. Katie kneels beside him, her eyes wide with concern, but also filled with a desperate kind of encouragement. We're almost there, Mark. We've come so far. We can't stop now. Tom, who's been scanning the clearing as if expecting to find a rescue team waiting for us, turns back and says, I'll go ahead, scout the clearing, and look for help or a way out. No, I counter firmly. Remembering how vulnerable we felt when separated even within the confines of our makeshift camp. Let's make a stretcher with our jackets and some sturdy branches. We can tie the jackets together with shoelaces to make a carrying surface. That way we carry Mark the rest of the way. Tom nods and we quickly get to work. We find some straight, strong branches and lay them parallel to each other. Next we take off our jackets and lay them across the branches lashing them in place with shoelaces and bits of rope from our backpacks. With cautious optimism, we carefully lift Mark onto the stretcher, doing our best to keep his sprained ankle elevated. His weight is distributed more evenly this way, making it less difficult for us to carry him. Each of us grabs a corner of the stretcher and we start to move, step by painstaking step, into the clearing. Katie takes the lead her eyes scanning the ground for obstacles, while Tom and I focus on keeping the stretcher level. As we make our way across the clearing, I feel a change in the atmosphere. The sense of being watched has lifted somewhat, replaced by the normal sounds of nature, the soft rustling of leaves and the distant calls of birds. Though we are physically drained emotionally, we are bolstered by the feeling that we're finally, truly making progress toward safety. We're almost to the other side of the clearing when Katie, a few steps ahead of us, freezes. Her eyes are on something on the ground. She brushes leaves aside and retrieves a notebook. The cover is frayed, and the pages inside have the yellow hue that comes with age. What have you got there? Tom's voice has a spark of curiosity, a momentary distraction from the physical and emotional exhaustion we all feel. It's a notebook, Katie says. She flips it open and begins scanning the pages quickly, her eyes darting from line to line. Seems like it belonged to the campers who were here before us. I can feel my stomach tighten. We can't afford to stop. We need to go, I urge, looking nervously back toward the trees surrounding the clearing. Katie holds up her hand. Hold on, you need to hear this. She starts reading from one of the dog-eared pages. We are not alone in this forest. Every night we hear it. It circles our camp just beyond the light from our fire. 
This isn't a bear or a wolf. It's different. A predator unlike any animal we know. If you find this, get out. Don't waste time. Katie closes the notebook, a look of deep concern replacing her earlier curiosity. Tom and I exchange glances. What Katie just read confirms our own experiences and amplifies the dread we've been trying to keep at bay. We need to leave now, Tom declares, a heightened urgency marking his voice. Nobody argues. We grasp the poles of the makeshift stretcher holding Mark, distributing the weight as evenly as we can. No more walking. We start to jog, feet pounding the soft forest floor as we aim for the boundary of this nightmarish woodland. Then it happens. The sound we've dreaded, that deep, almost mocking call, explodes from the direction we've just come from. Closer this time, so close it feels like a punch in the gut. It's as if the forest itself is issuing a final warning, a sinister valediction that makes my skin crawl. Run! Katie's voice shatters the frozen moment, jolting us into action. Ignoring the pain, the fatigue, and the weight of the stretcher, we bolt. Each of us digs deep, finding a reservoir of energy we didn't know we had. Adrenaline surges through me, making my legs pump faster and my grip tightens. The forest blurs around me, trees and shadows melding into a single dark mass as we near the forest's edge. My lungs are on fire, and Mark is groaning with each jolt of the stretcher, but there's no stopping. Just when it feels like my body can't take another step, the forest gives way to the gravel road where we parked our car. The forest's boundary ends and our car comes into view, parked in the open gravel space. Tom and I set down the stretcher beside the car while Katie keeps watch, her eyes darting back to the forest edge. I dig into my pocket for my keys. My hands tremble and I fumble the keys before managing to unlock the car. We quickly transfer Mark into the back seat, doing our best to keep his legs stable. Our backpacks follow, hastily tossed in beside him. Katie claims the passenger seat, still clutching the tattered notebook like a talisman. Tom climbs into the back, positioning himself to support Mark's leg for the ride. I take a deep breath as I slide into the driver's seat, inserting the key into the ignition. When the engine ignites with a robust roar, it's as if the sound drowns out some of the forest's lingering menace. My foot stomps on the gas pedal and gravel crunches beneath the tires as we bolt from the parking area. We exchange glances, our faces etched with a relief that words can't capture. No one talks, no one needs to. After a week of being cooped up in an office, doing nothing but staring at a screen and typing away from nine to five, it's natural for people to want to relax and forget about their monotonous, miserable jobs. Some go out to party with friends. Some stay at home and sleep through the whole week. Some seek solace in the great outdoors. I'm no different. After a long week of work, I would almost always go to my sawmill to relax. I inherited the sawmill from my dad but it was originally built and used by my grandfather. After he passed, he left it to my dad, who tried to make money off of it and started a small business, which didn't really go anywhere, so he had to close it down soon after. Since he didn't want to take care of it, he gave it to me. It was pretty small and it didn't have any big fancy machines in there, but it held a special place in my home. I remember how I'd always watch my granddad work on some of his projects how I would always pester him about every little thing he did. This sawmill was located pretty much in the middle of nowhere, in a small clearing surrounded by thick woods. The only way to get there was by following a winding dirt road for about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how fast you drove. Now it's not like I wasn't doing anything while I was there. At first I just messed around with all the different machines, but with time I began to learn how to properly use them, so I put myself to work. First I cut 2x4s all day, then I tried making more complex stuff. Of course it wasn't anything special at first, and the majority of the things I tried to make failed miserably. But with time, I got the hang of things, and started to produce stuff that was at least one time at work we were talking about something. I can't remember exactly what, but I think it had something to do with what we would be doing that weekend. Because I mentioned my new woodworking hobby, my co-workers were interested. So I started boasting about how I sometimes made furniture and all kinds of things in my sawmill. After that, I slowly started getting requests from people to make them things. It was mostly basic stuff, 
like a nightstand or a small shelf, things like that. It began with just a couple of co-workers who I was close to, but then it spread to the rest of the office and even to their friends and family. And so my weakened woodworking projects that had initially been a solitary escape had transformed into a side business of sorts. I didn't mind making stuff for them, especially because everyone that wanted something offered to pay. But to be honest, I would have probably made it for free if they asked. It doesn't cost me much, and it's something I really love doing. I'm not going to lie, the first few projects I finished were rough, but bit by bit I was getting better and better, and I got to the point where I was actually proud of the stuff I was making. One day as I wrapped up my work at the office and was about to go home, I got a call from one of my close friends named Matt. Matt asked me if I could make him a table for his newly renovated front porch. I of course happily accepted the job, and I said I could start working on it that weekend. When Friday was finally over, I went home, got something to eat, changed into my normal clothes, and started driving to the sawmill. After 20 minutes, I finally arrived. Every time I go there, the first thing I always notice is the distinct aroma of sawdust and the earthy scent of the surrounding forest. As I stepped out of my car, my boots crunched against the gravel driveway, and I couldn't help but smile, thinking about my project. The old wooden building, weathered by time, stood with its own kind of rustic beauty. It was painted in faded red, with the color chipped and peeling off. In front of it was my old pickup truck, which I used to transport logs from the forest to the sawmill. Every time I saw that old building, it reminded me of my grandpa, my old man, and all the things big and small that were made in that small sawmill over the three generations. I pushed open the creaky door, and the interior was bathed in soft golden light coming through the dusty windows. My tools were hung on the walls, and the workbenches still had wood chips scattered over them from my last project. The centerpiece of the room was the saw itself, a big intimidating machine capable of cutting through the thickest logs with ease. I spent some time thinking about the table Matt had asked me to make, about its design and what wood to use. After a while, I got an idea. I already had the majority of the things I would need for the table, but I wanted to make it special since Matt was a very good friend of mine. The forest surrounding the sawmill provided the perfect source of inspiration for this piece. I ventured deep into the woods deeper than ever before, in search of a couple of smaller trees or branches that I had in mind. I walked so far that nothing seemed familiar anymore. The air was thick with the scent of pine, and the ground was covered in a carpet of fallen leaves, creating a serene, albeit faintly creepy, atmosphere. After trudging through the unfamiliar woods for a while, I finally found what I was looking for. A few small pine trees that fell over naturally, creating an opportunity to repurpose them into something grand. I carefully cut them into carryable pieces, since I would have to transport them manually to my pickup, which couldn't go that far into these woods. Despite the trees being small, I could see that I would have to make that trip multiple times in order to get all of them. With a bit of effort, I started hauling them back to the truck. I walked peacefully for a few minutes, just enjoying the nature and the great outdoors, even with all the cargo I was carrying with me. After a few more minutes of walking, I started to feel uneasy. I didn't know why exactly, but I chalked it up to me just being paranoid or getting lost in an unfamiliar part of the woods. The uneasy feeling only grew larger, however. I started looking around the woods for God knows what. At one point when I glanced behind me, I saw something. It was a person standing near one of the trees in the back. It was hard to see, but I'm positive that it was a man. After I saw them, I got really weirded out and began to walk as fast as I could with all the stuff I had on me. I was back in the part of the woods which I knew how to navigate. I speed walked for about a minute and I could already see my truck in the distance. But my relief soon turned to dread as I heard what sounded like running behind me. I quickly turned around and I saw that man sprinting towards me. Terrified, I dropped everything I had and began to run as fast as I could back to the sawmill. I contemplated getting into the pickup truck, but by the time I got that thing running, the man would already catch up to me so I ran past the old truck and continued running to the sawmill. I got inside and quickly locked the door, shutting the blinds on the windows. Soon after that, the man also got to the sawmill. Badly out of breath, I stood there, thinking of what to do next. I took a piece of wood that was near me, to at least have something to defend myself with. 
At that point I was freaking out, just waiting for this person outside to break the door down and attack me. I saw his shadow under the door. He just stood there, outside, motionless. It felt like this was going on for hours, but I'm sure it was just a few minutes at most. I couldn't believe it was happening. The little place I found comfort and solace in could very well end up being my resting place. I could feel my heart racing, my blood rushing throughout my body, my mind twisted and turned as I tried to make sense of the situation. Who was this guy? Why was he chasing me through the woods? What was he doing in these woods in the first place? Fear gnawed at me, and I knew I needed to act fast, to protect myself, to find a way out. What do you want? I shouted. This is private property. Leave or you'll be shot. I added the threat. It was an empty threat, but maybe it would back him off. But the man wouldn't budge. A few seconds after my shouts, he moved back a couple of steps, and he started to speak. His words were in a language I'd never heard before, and he wasn't even talking normally. It sounded more like he was reciting a poem, or like some sort of chanting rather than the typical sound of a person talking. I don't completely remember what happened after that. Every time I do try to remember, it's like a wall of fog forms in my memories, and I can't remember much. All I know is that I was standing there with a stick in hand, one second, and the next I was on the floor, with the worst headache of my life. I looked around, and I saw that the door was still shut and locked, and all the windows were still intact. When I somewhat came to my senses, I realized something was happening out there, outside. I could hear something running around the sawmill, growling and hissing. Whatever it was, it wasn't the person that was chasing me earlier. Of that I was certain. The thing that was making laps around the building was running on four feet, and from what I could see through the shutters it had fur. It made a few more laps around the sawmill, and almost as if it knew I had woke up, ran off somewhere. I wasn't sure where it went, but at least I didn't hear the footsteps anymore. I sat there on the floor for what felt like forever, shivering in fear. By the time I convinced myself that whatever was outside had gone and didn't have any intention of returning. It was already dark outside. I stood up with my head still in immense pain and slowly, quietly opened the door. It was pitch black outside and the nearby forest was now shrouded in darkness with the moonlight casting eerie shadows everywhere I looked. As I left my sawmill with the piece of wood still in hand, I noticed that everything was silent too. There were no crickets chirping, no owls hooting, nothing. Just complete and utter silence. Cautiously I walked to my car which I had parked near the road. Once I finally got in the car, I threw the wood on the ground and I sat inside, breathing a sigh of relief. When I turned on the car and was preparing to drive away, I heard something from the woods, something loud, something I've never heard before. I slowly turned my head towards the woods, and when I saw it, my stomach sank. There were two big, glowing eyes watching me from the forest. When my eyes met them, that thing produced a sound so haunting and vile that I can never forget it. I floored it and started driving as fast as I could. After all the dust and smoke from the dirt road cleared, I looked in my rearview mirror, only to see something trailing behind me, running fast, trying to catch up to my car. I started to drive even faster, almost getting thrown off the winding road in the process. It felt like that road would never end, and the hopelessness in me grew larger with each passing second. But just as I started to think that all hope was lost, I saw road lights, and road lights meant I was close to the main road, close to escaping. At least I thought it wouldn't chase me from there. When I finally got off the dirt road and onto the main road, I could much better see what had been chasing me under these lights. It was a horse, or rather, something that looked like a horse. There was no way that a horse could or would chase a car in the middle of the night, for no reason. Every cell in my body was telling me that it was the same thing that had been running around my sawmill. Thankfully, this horse did stop following me once I made it to the main road, just as I had hoped. Even if it did continue on, there's no way it could have caught up to me with how fast I was going at that point, flying down the road. When I got home, I almost immediately fell asleep, due to all the stress and exhaustion. It's been three years now since that incident. I don't know what any of that was, why it all happened, and I don't plan on finding out. The next time I tried to go back to the sawmill, this time armed, just in case, I couldn't even make it all the way back.
because half a mile before the sawmill my head began to pound and ache so bad that I had to turn back. And when I did turn back, the pain faded. I don't really know what that animal was and who that man was, and I don't know what happened to either of them. But his chanting is now permanently etched into my memory. I live on the outskirts of Buffalo, for a rather large city. Shockingly, there seems to be not much going on. I recently began working at the library here. It's a large building with thousands of books and people going in and out every day. I've been here almost four months now, and I've seen many things that have made me take a second glance. On one occasion, there was an elderly woman in the bathroom. She looked friendly. She wore a brown sweater and a tan skirt. I gave her a friendly smile and turned to grab my purse, which I'd forgotten in the stall. I didn't hear a door close. I heard no other footsteps. But when I turned around, there was no trace of the older lady. I left slightly puzzled, but since my break was over, I hurried to the front desk and forgot about the strange encounter until I'd returned home, where I rationalized it to being tired and perhaps overworked. A few weeks ago, I had just clocked in. I was ready to work overnight, stacking books for patrons the next day, deciding how to organize things for the day shift, who would show up at 7 a.m., at the time, it was me and my co-worker, Amy. Amy had the book cart, stacking some fantasy books back onto the shelves. She was humming to her music and completely oblivious to anything around her. I was handling reference materials that evening, which meant I went down to the lowest floor of the building with a cart loaded with dozens of books from the day. I took the elevator down. This part of the night was always unnerving and made me rather paranoid. The hallways were far too quiet and the elevator itself had this high electric hum that sometimes these semi-dark hallways. I exited the elevator and swung a left into the nearest room. The lights were off, which slightly set me on edge, as this was a room that was always to be lit because it had expensive records that were often kept under monitoring. Honestly, I had no idea what was going on, but I remembered that the switch was down the hallway. So I left the book cart and went to the control panel a few doors down. I thought I heard my book cart move after I flicked the light on the panel. I figured it was possibly day shift. Maybe there was a newbie who knew no better. So I went back into the reference room and found my cart oddly not where I left it. It now sat by the chairs in the middle of the room. I thought then maybe I hadn't locked the wheels and the floor might be a bit uneven so it had rolled there somehow. I grabbed a small armful of books, walking towards the back of the room where these shelves split. I followed the wall putting the books where they went until I caught a glimpse of Tan Whisk by the edge of a shelf. I was immediately alarmed because nobody but myself and Amy were supposed to be here, and as two rather short ladies, I don't think our five forest statures could take out an intruder. It wouldn't have been the first time a homeless man had entered the building and we had to call security from the parking lot. My hand drifted to my phone. I had security on speed dial at the time and I was about to call rounding the corner of a shelf, a rather heavy book in my other hand. I took a soft breath and continued my way along the shelves, acting as if the book would offer any protection, while my phone dialed the number for Henry, our night guard. He was rather groggy when he answered, Yeah, Julie. What is it this time? A big spider? He joked with me, probably trying to keep himself awake. Not this time. I told him what I saw and he was immediately worried, telling me to keep an eye out and he would check the cameras while he was on the phone with me. I haven't seen anything on the cameras for hours. The lights were out, but I didn't think anything of it at the time. I'll call Amy and do a scan of the building. I'll stay where I am and close the door. I frowned heavily, and I looked around the room to a small room adjacent. It was a small study room our patrons could rent for schoolwork, or even just a few hours of light reading. I found that my best option. I snuck my way over there, closing the heavy oak door and using my staff key to lock the door. I kept hearing small taps outside the door but didn't see anything through the glass wall, until there it was, crumpled underneath the low wooden tables. A figure in brown tatters, with a long, unkempt beard and wild eyes. I was about to call Henry back until I saw something that made bile rise in my throat, a glint of silver and black resting in the man's hand. It was coated in aged brown colors, either rust or blood. I really didn't want to know, so I just stared and started trembling. 
I wish I could say I was brave or something like that, some sort of hero, but I sat there and started absolutely sobbing in terror. I knew he couldn't get to me unless he broke the window, but that didn't stop the sheer panic building in my chest and the screaming in my head. I gathered myself after a few moments and called Henry back, warning him of what I saw. He asked if I was safe and quickly hung up with me to call the police once he had determined I was fine. The police showed up about ten minutes later, and the man by this point was stabbing the blade into the window that separated us. He was wide-eyed and so ballistic that I swore he was a lunatic. His lips curled up in glee as he slammed the blade into the window over and over. The soft tinks drowned out in my wail of horror. He fought the police when they came, managing to slice into the arm of one officer until the other pinned him and yanked the blade from his hand. I gave my report once they had him under control and in custody. A few days later I reached out to the police and got them to tell me the story after a bit of prodding. Turns out the man was on substances and had been homeless seeking shelter for the evening. He'd hid in the dark room thinking he would leave in the morning. When he saw me and thought I would throw him out, he stalked me through the aisles of books and intended to kill me, just so he wouldn't get caught. I'd come very close to having my life ended that night. We added more security after the event, and now Amy and I never leave each other's signs during the shift. I wish I could say I was over this, but I don't see myself not looking over my shoulder or jumping over every little noise in the dark for a while to come. This isn't a happy story. It's about a childhood friend of mine who I'll call Alice. Alice lived in the inner city. The apartment complex she, her mom, and brothers lived in was harsh, to say the least. My dad didn't want me to go anywhere near it. But Alice and I were friends, and thankfully one of her siblings was a rather large brother, who I'll call Brutus. That's not his real name, but boy howdy did it fit. Mm -hmm. Knowing how overprotective and massive he was, was the one thing that made my dad relent and allow me to sleep over occasionally. Now I didn't live in the Ritz. My home life was anything, maybe everything, other than pleasant. But it was still better than where Alice was forced to live. All kinds of people dwelled there. But it was the people who didn't actually live there who really made my skin crawl. Every so often you'd catch sight of one of them, ducking out of the way of a flickering street light, or prowling down on the sidewalk below her home. But of all the questionable tenants who lived there, None were worse than the ones who lived in the walls. Those tenants were rats, and they were everywhere. On more than one occasion I tripped over them as they darted out in front of us. The first few times I screamed, but after a while it became so commonplace I would just shake my head and keep walking. Like I said, it happened frequently, but not all the time. But they were always there. I don't think there wasn't ever a time I didn't hear them skittering about and gnawing in the walls. I flinched every time I heard their tiny claws scratching away, but Alice didn't seem to notice. I guess she had become so desensitized to it that she didn't react to the sound, even when I was safely back in the confines of my own home. The thought of her living like that kept me up at night. I'd sit there and think about my friend lying in her bed, being lulled to sleep by the sound of rodents constantly clawing away at what should have been her sanctuary. There was one other constant in her dismal prison, the smell of decay and rot. The stench seemed to permeate from the very walls of that horrendous apartment complex. They'd grow thick and slowly fade off, only to be replaced by another one, an endless stream of noxious skid marks that seared their way into your nostrils. Sadly, like so many things she had to deal with, she just got used to it. It saturated the smaller rooms like their bedrooms, it was a little better in larger spaces, like the living room, which thankfully had a large window. It got so bad sometimes that it made me want to gag. I tried to get Alice out of that place. The playground, a shopping mall, a park, anywhere. Any place was preferable to her being in her home. One day a woman was attacked just a few doors down from where Alice and her family lived. That was the last straw for my dad. I was no longer allowed to visit my friend's home anymore. Of course, she could stay with us from time to time. Her mother never said no. I don't know if she was just happy to have one less kid in the house, or grateful that her daughter wasn't in that awful place temporarily. Whatever her reasoning, I felt like we were doing something good by having her over. It felt like we were doing our part to protect her. Before you get it into your head that Alice's mom didn't care for her daughter, she did. 
She worked two jobs to put clothes on her kids' backs and food on the table. When he was old enough, Brutus got a job too. They got by, but that was about it. Alice, sweet as she was, didn't seem to be bothered by the addicts, street workers, and vermin around her. It was what it was, and she wasn't about to let it carve a hole into her life. She seemed to silently stave off any justifiable feelings of bitterness. One day, Alice didn't show up at our school. Most of the kids didn't even seem to notice. One of the girls I wished hadn't come in made a snotty comment about the stink girl being out, saying she must have been too busy dumpster diving and lost track of time. Life can be pretty unfair. Alice already had it rough, and here someone who was obviously better off than she was, was ridiculing her in front of all her peers. Alice didn't show up for class the day after or the day after that. As time passed, it became clear that we would no longer see her again. It took a while for police to get around to finding out what had happened to her. Naturally, her immediate family were the first persons of interest on their list. The only problem was no one could find them, any of them. Now, obviously, we weren't a part of the investigation, but one of the officers involved had a son in the grade ahead of us. I wanted to know what had happened to my friend. So I hunted him down after class one day and asked him if they'd found anything. As it turned out, they had discovered something. They found everything except what they were there looking for. He told me his dad said when they went inside, the apartment looked like they'd left for the day. It was a day that stretched out forever. No one ever heard from any of them again. Tales born of ignorance spread like a cancer throughout school. In one story, her family had been killed by drug dealers. In another, her parents had gotten into debt with all the wrong people, and they'd been forced to sell her to human traffickers. On and on the stories went, each worse than the last. As the years ticked by, her story faded from most people's memory. Keep in mind the area we lived in was pretty urban. Within weeks of her disappearance, two students in a nearby school were gunned down. Another was shot while robbing a convenience store. In places like where I grew up, catastrophe is a thin paint, one easily washed away by the endless march of time and tragedy. Alice's story fell into the memory hole as we steeled ourselves for what waited for us tomorrow. But I never forgot. I grew up, graduated, went to college, and settled down into a life far from the wasteland of my youth. But I never forgot her. One day I got a text from one of my old childhood acquaintances. She said they'd found something, something terrible. She didn't want to provide many details. She just said they'd found her, and gave me the number of someone who knew the full story. I tried to keep the conversation going, but after she'd given me the guy's contact info, she stopped responding to my texts. I was infuriated. It had been twenty long years of emptiness. Someone knew what had happened and the best they could do was pass me along to someone else. I wanted to scream. I expected the man to be yet another dead end, a tease that promised to grant me closure but would provide no resolution to Alice's life. But I wanted to know what had happened to Alice and this person allegedly knew the truth. As it turned out, the man, let's call him Adam, had almost all the answers I'd been searching for. When he finished telling me what had been found, I think I'd have preferred not knowing. I was about to ask something stupid when it struck me what he was alluding to. Where was she? What found her? What remained of her? In the walls? The brutal answer made me want to cry, but there were far too many questions in my head to allow my emotions to take hold. Where? How did it take so long to find her? There was tattered plastic all around her body. It took them a while to get through the plastic to get at her. At first I thought Adam was talking about the police, but that didn't make sense the way he said it. To get at her, them who? The apartment complex she was living in was shut down a couple years after she went missing. The theory we're working with was that her body had decomposed past the point where there was any noticeable smell. With all the rumors and noise around their disappearance, Nobody wanted to be in that apartment. We think this was why nobody noticed any smell. It was his use of the word they that reminded me of something we'd all forgotten. The other members of her family had also gone missing. Were her mom and brothers there with her? In fact, we still haven't found them. For all we know, they could still be alive. Or whoever did this could have disposed of them somewhere else. My mind raced toward the worst-case scenario imaginable. Was she alive when... He knew what I was asking and decided to put an end to the conversation. We don't think so. I've already told you too much and I don't think you're handling this well. 
I'll just say that she was dead. Before she was put into the plastic. I didn't know her. You did. Please don't ask anymore. She's been found. I was silent for a moment. My first reaction was to be offended, but then I realized he had my best interests at heart. The facts were so cruel. For me, if any member of her family deserved to have her body be somewhere else, it was Alice. That has to sound very inconsiderate to the other members of her family, but the rats and Alice, it's just too much for me. It was like they had taken bits out of her entire life, and then once the world had finally killed her, they ate what little was left. Everything about the situation confirmed that my dad had it right about the neighborhood she was trapped in, but not about her. As you might have gathered, she was skinny and small, a little thing with an old soul. There are so many stories out there about monsters that are seven or eight feet tall. I don't find them frightening. You can run away from a single giant monster if need be, but you can't escape a sea of ravenous vermin around 11 inches in length. Monsters that swarm over you, each taking a small chunk of your body. With no family, no money, and having died decades earlier, were no services held. She was cremated, and her remains were spread out somewhere around that hateful city. Her story shouldn't be my story, but sadly, hers has bled into my mind. Some nights I dreamt she was sleeping when whoever killed her burst into her dismal room and knocked her unconscious. In my dream, she woke up later, slowly suffocating as the rats tore at the plastic trying to get at her. My mind became hers. She struggled against her bonds, only to realize there was no way she could break free. She, I, cried at the last sound she heard, the sounds of those vicious creatures trying to claw their way in. The brightest part of these nightmares was the blissful embrace of death, which invariably occurred just before the vermin broke their way into her plastic tomb. For months afterward, I woke up screaming. Every time something unidentifiable brushed up beside me, I'd flinch away. The slightest scratching sound was enough to drive me into another room. I only knew Alice for a few years, but her life changed mine forever. The short time she spent in this world was marred with sorrow and pain. It was 1985. I was a senior in high school. My nephew Patch, niece Marie and I, you can call me Esther, were all working at a chicken joint in Trenton, New Jersey. It was a local place that doesn't exist anymore so I won't bother to name it. We come from a large Puerto Rican family. My mother and my sister were both pregnant at the same time, so Patch and I are the same age, and Marie is just one year younger. Our family is close-knit, and we all stick up for one another no matter what, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's one of the reasons we all worked at the same place. We all vouched for each other. I'm not sure of the month, but I know it was a cold winter's night. The store was closed and we were all cleaning and prepping the food for the next day. Patch Marie, our manager Joan and I were all working the closing shift along with a guy named Larry. Joan was a sweetheart. We considered her our work mother. We could tell her things we couldn't tell our strict parents and she would give us advice and guidance. We all called her mom with the exception of Larry. Larry hadn't been working there long enough but the rest of us considered her family. Let me tell you about Larry. He's the heir to a chain of funeral homes that stretch from Jersey to Delaware. He wasn't working there for the necessity of a paycheck. Like the rest of us, he had some mental issues, and his father wanted him to get some socialization. His father arranged the job for him with the store's owner. They'd gone to college together, and they were fraternity brothers. I don't know if it was because of his mental issues or growing up around dead bodies. Maybe a combination of the two, but Larry was creepy. I worked up front, but on occasion I would enter the kitchen where he would be prepping the raw chicken for a marinade, and he'd always have the creepiest smile on his face. He would say things like, do you know how we prep dead people for embalming? We lay them on an ice block to drain them, or I like the feeling of cutting into flesh. He once picked up a knife and pointed it at another cook, saying, you know if I slit your corroded artery just under your arm, you would bleed to death in minutes. He exuded a very creepy vibe. He would stare at women's chests when talking to them and make inappropriate remarks. One time I was at the register checking out a customer. When he came up behind me so close his lips were touching my hair, and he said, I made up a corpse to look just like you last night. Ugh, he was so disturbing. I get goosebumps just thinking about him. 
Nobody liked him, not even the managers. We all complained, but the complaints went unanswered. He was Teflon, you see, his father and the owner being frat bros and all that. There was nothing we could do. And like I said before, we needed our paychecks. Now that you have the backstory, let's get back to the winter night shift in Trenton. I was cleaning the front end. Ponch and Joan were cleaning the kitchen. Marie was cleaning the dining room. And Larry was cleaning the bathroom. The closing shift was fun. We would blast the music and dance and joke around while we worked. It was the 80s, and we were listening to the radio, obviously not Spotify. The song Object of My Desire by Starpoint came on, and it was a real bop. We all began to sing along, dancing too. Joan danced her way to the front end, singing. There was a line in the song that says, You're the object of my desire. Hey, you really turned me on. Joan grabbed a bunch of straws as a makeshift mic and sang those lines really loud. That's when Larry ran out of the bathroom holding a toilet brush, saying, I will turn you on, and making a lewd in-and-out motion with the toilet brush. Joan turned beet red. As I stated previously, Joan was basically family, so we stick up for family. From behind the counter, I yelled at him, saying, You can't talk to her like that. Maria was in the dining room with Larry. She approached him angrily, asking, What did you just say? Over and over again. She pulled back her arm and punched him square in the face. In response, I guess instinctively, he pushed her hard and she fell on the floor, sliding back a little. I crawled over the countertop and ran over to him, slapping him across the face, telling him to never put his hands on my knees ever again. By the time Joan and Patch reached us, Larry's nose was bleeding, and tears were streaming down his face. He was shouting, I'm going to kill all of you. You're all dead. Patch pulled him away from us and pinned him against the wall, arm to the throat, angrily telling him to shut up. Joan was making sure me and Marie were okay. Then she told him that he had to leave. Patch dragged him by the scruff of his shirt, unlocked the front door, and pushed him out. Larry turned towards him before the door slammed shut and said, Remember how he told me they would use ice blocks to prepare bodies? Patch engaged the deadbolt, and we watched him walk away in the snow. We all looked at each other, and we just knew that we were all in a lot of trouble. Larry's father usually picked him up at the end of his shift. This was a time before cell phones, so he would use the store phone to call his dad. We'd thrown this kid out into the snow without a way to contact anyone. Streets of Trenton are not safe at night, then or now. Joan said, he only lives a block away trying to comfort us. I'll talk to the boss in the morning. I realized then his house must be attached to that funeral home nearby. I didn't dare speak aloud what everyone else was thinking. We just got back to work. The place was small, so it didn't take us long to finish. It had been about twenty minutes since Larry left, and Marie was cleaning the drive through window when she screamed. We all rushed over to see what was wrong, and in a whispering and frightened voice she told us something metal had hit the window hard. We all began to hear scraping and banging sounds all around the building. The windows were tinted, and with all the lights on inside, it was difficult to see out into the night. Scraping across the windows, we scrambled to make sure all the windows and doors were bolted shut. We were all freaked out, locking ourselves into the windowless bathroom. We were shaking and asking Joan what we should do. She said, I'm going to go call the cops, but the phone's in the office, I said. I know. If you like, we can all go together. Marie, Patch, and I were shaking our heads and saying no. We'll be okay, she said. Do you trust me? We nodded yes and looked towards the door. She unlocked the bathroom door and poked her head out and looked around. There's no one out there, she said. You'll need to stay put until I unlock the door to the kitchen. Then we go together. We nodded again. The seconds waiting seemed like hours and we all together jumped when she opened the bathroom door, waving us out. With Joan in the lead, we kept our backs to the wall as we slowly made our way to the office. The banging and scraping had stopped by now, but we stayed locked in that office until we saw red and blue flashing lights. As the police took our statements, they said, You really shouldn't have hit him, but we will go have a talk with him. To put it bluntly, we can't do much else because you hit him first. They waited until we all piled into Joan's car and pulled away. Joan dropped all of us at Amy's house as nobody wanted to be alone. Joan lived in Philadelphia, but she called us when she was back home safe and sound with her husband. Patch Marie and I barely slept. You see, unlike Joan, we lived in Trenton, and we didn't know if Larry knew where we lived. 
The sound of the phone startled me awake, and when I answered, it was the store owner. We're all fired. You're lucky the family isn't pressing assault charges on you guys, he said. What were you thinking? I don't know. I stuttered. Patch grabbed the phone for me and said, We quit, and slammed the receiver down. We were already fired, but yeah. We called Joan after that, and she too had received an angry phone call. She told us everything would be okay. Life carried on, and unfortunately, we fell out of touch with Joan. Patch and I graduated and went off to college. Marie followed the next year. Since then, Patch has passed away, but Marie and I are still as close as ever with families of our own. None of us ever saw Larry since that day. Then again, we never saw him before working together. I hope he's in a better state as an adult. I do regret hitting him. And what's that thing they say about hindsight?